But without digging here, we wouldn't have found this large, well-preserved male skeleton. It was buried with this amazing brooch, which dates the body to the late 13th century, when the priory was probably at its zenith. At the height of its power, the priory must have been an awe-inspiring place, a wealthy royal foundation and a focal point for pilgrims for hundreds of years. But by the time the monasteries were dissolved in the 16th century, it had already fallen into disrepair. It's a rather sad story. In the kitchen, broken pots. You come into the pantry, a plain old tablecloth. There's no evidence of great wealth there. Oh, that is um, really, really sad. You come down, they had one horse and an old broken cart. Oh my God, it's that is so It's a very sad really picture upsetting. you get of the Priory in its mm. last days. This is where the huge east window was, and who knows, the shrine of Anna, the first Christian king of East Anglia. Well, I haven't got the east wall, Mick, but I know where it was. I mean, you can see here, look, look how the level of the sand drops really, really rapidly down here like this. And all this is actually filled up with demolition rubble. The amazing thing is, it's actually on this fence line. It's, it's actually respecting the property boundary. On an old property boundary. Absolutely. Right. And I'll tell you something else about it, too. This is a posh end of the church. Look at these. Beautiful pieces of work. This is posh flint work for the real expensive part of the church. And that is what you'd expect yeah. at the East End. Yeah, that's very good, like the present parish church. And there was more good news, really good news. Radiocarbon analysis suggests the burials in Phil's Trench date to 930 AD. That means this man was buried 200 years before Henry I's priory was built on top of him. And in Jackie's Trench at the foot of the church, the bones date much further back to the mid-7th century. That's around the time that King Anna was killed. So we can safely say that we've looked the Saxons in the face. It looks as if their church was here on this site, even though it could have been destroyed in later Viking raids. As for the whereabouts of King Anna's tomb, that still remains a mystery. So even after this hugely frustrating dig with all its puzzles and dead ends, we can show Nick and Susan that an impressive Augustinian church ran across more than the full width of their garden, with a great tower held up by pillars towards the east end and a cloister to the north. Nick, you've been glued to this that's for that's ages that's now, that's haven't you? Yes, it's fascinating. I bet when we came here, you never thought you'd see all this. No, no, it's been mind-blowing. Mind-blowing because, at the first thing, I didn't realise just how big the church was. Yeah. I just had no concept whatsoever. The children are making us a model of Burford, and in return, Mix agreed to tell them the story of the town. But will he be able to pull it all together in time? Well, at least we now know that our story begins with the Saxons in the area of the back garden. So, are you still happy you've got an Anglo-Saxon house? Definitely, without a shadow. And do we know the date? A 650 to 850. Can you show me your house? I am, if you follow me. We're now in the entrance of the house. Yep. And so what we've got down here is a beam slot. So that's one wall there. That's one wall. Fay, 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 Fay. What's this thing here? This is a pit. It's had pottery, it had bone in, and probably from when they constructed the building, they put a load of stuff in. All right. So if we walk this way, yeah. we've got another pit here, which is actually where I got a load of animal bone. And this could possibly be like the hearth area where they had their final meal before they scarpered. Yeah. And then if we keep walking down this way to here, this is the end of our house. It's pretty small, isn't it? It is, but it's cosy. Our Saxon house is a little gem. We hardly ever find timber buildings as old as this one. The small village it belonged to was founded sometime after 650 AD, before vanishing around 1100. Take it away, Mr Storyteller. <laughs> <laughs> so you know where your school is, you know where the river is, you know where the main road is up the middle of the town. OK? First bit of the story we can't put on here. You found Roman pottery. We don't know where the Roman site is. The bit you also found was lots of Saxon pottery. And we now think there's a Saxon settlement, Saxon village, somewhere here. My 
lovely assistant <laughs> Stuart, Debbie McGee of the archaeological world, will put on a little yep. Saxon There's building, Saxons. right? And that lasts from about 400 AD right through to about 1100 AD. And then sometime after 1100, they build the new town down the main street. That's where your houses come in. So take the Saxon village away, because everybody's moved into the town, right? The village goes away. And then all down the main street, build the houses. Put your two there. Leave a gap here. Yeah. 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 Pass them up, there we go. There we go. Do the other end like that, look. Here we are, mate. Oh, they, they, they can put them on there, look. The ones at the back can reach. I can only reach so far. There we go. More houses, mate. Oh, it's filling up with new people, this town, isn't it? It's all over, isn't it? Oh, the chimney's falling off. <laughs> Once the town is built, the hospital, which is on this site, where the poor people and the sick people were looked after, was built next to your school. And that then went on right the way through to about the time of the Tudors, when that was taken down, and on the site was built the beginnings of this big house here. Yeah. So there it is. <laughs> And that's more or less as it is today, isn't it? Big house at the Priory, the parish church and the town all laid out along the street. So we've just looked at over a thousand years of history. <laughs> Burford's got talent. <laughs> I, they are splendid houses. You've done very well there. That's really good. Our story of Burford isn't unique. A similar one could be told in any number of towns across the country. Ours started with just a few bits of pottery in this garden and a lot of luck. And just think, we'd never have known any of this if one archaeologist hadn't got just that little bit nosy. The hall must have looked really impressive. But this isn't the only hall we think we've got on this site. The crop marks suggest there are four more. Yesterday, we opened a trench and it looked like these are halls, which could make this a royal site. Now I get it. At first, I couldn't understand why a royal center would be in the middle of nowhere. But if this was a riverside site on the main road, then I can see why it became so important. And it's now nearly the end of our time at Sutton Courtney. And I think the archaeologists finally have a handle on the site. We are standing in the Sunken Future building. A grub today. Yep, a grub. <laughs> <laughs> and if we come over here, basically what they did is they put a big hall ah. over the top of it. So we've got a wall here Coming and it through. goes through where you're standing. And, and then out right. and returning back through there. Yeah. Where you are right now is our entranceway. And then the, the, the building is running straight back through that way. Is it? yeah, it's, it along, is. it's along this way. Yep. So the doorway is again in the end and not in the side. So brilliantly, it does seem we've got two phases of Anglo-Saxons, who first lived here in grub huts as a small community, which then grew as they were replaced with a series of halls. Since this hall is very much like the Great Hall, we think it's contemporary, proving that this was a royal site. It's a pretty exciting piece of archaeology, isn't it? It is absolutely fantastic. We've got the end of one wall there, we've got the end of another wall there. In between is this great big elaborate entrance, and once you've come through the gable wall, and you walk into the hall, we've got a wall there and a wall there, and you've got to imagine them going right up, up to the, to the ridge. We've got maybe seven metres up there. And look at the scale of it. I mean, can you imagine the size of fire you would need to heat this huge space? would have been just absolutely, literally awesome. Now, look, these are rough plans of hitherto the largest buildings from Anglo-Saxon England, both from Yevering in Northumberland. Now, this one is ours, and look, it is substantially bigger. And we dug it up. We did. What a result. Three days, and we've got a whole Anglo-Saxon royal riverside complex. And not just one hall, but possibly the biggest great hall the Anglo-Saxons ever built. Whoever would have thought that at the end of day three we would be sitting inside an Anglo-Saxon Great Hall? Well, I thought this was going to be a great site, but honestly, it's exceeded all my expectations. 
Nick, Helen said to me earlier, this is why I went into archaeology in the oh, first yeah, place. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, this, this is so important. It's, it's, it's the point at which England starts. Yeah. yeah. Well, Carls and Thanes, uh, as we've done so well, I think we all deserve to uh, get stuck in with a bit of drinking, don't you? Yeah. Hang on a minute, Tony. Yeah. I've got to earn it first. <laughs> <coughs> Mateus, ik de on sedge, that thing is shovel, is new and sharp. Philippus, un sharper is mean shovel, aksemara is hay than thine. Up thine. Oh, he's the winner. <laughs> so the uh, the drink will now be presented to the winner by the lady of the house. Oh. And we will honour the winner with the traditional cheer. Wasse! Hello, my name's John Gator. Time Team is fan funded by Patreon. This vital support helps us to make new episodes. Joining Patreon gives you access to exclusive interviews, 3D models, and masterclasses, plus lots more.